Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Do you love to learn? I know I do, and each podcast guest I have on here brings something new to the table. You know they say you learn something new every day? Well, I feel like the days I have podcasts, I learn enough new things for the month. If you're listening today, chances are you love learning too, especially if you're a fan of Runners Connect. You know, we pride ourselves on being the no fluff of the running world. Each of the guests that I have on the show have that in common, as as well as obviously loving running. And my guest today has more titles and interests to his name than any other guest I've had on the show. But I love that about him. Dr. Steve Prebert has listened to many of the Run to the Top podcasts and enjoyed listening to the various perspectives. That is an even better quality to have in a person. You love to learn and you're open-minded to new suggestions. Hopefully you will find this conversation as fun as I did and you'll find out Not only had I done my homework on his background, but he'd actually done his homework on me. That made the interview even more interesting as he could call out some of my mistakes. You should know by now that I'm pretty honest with my journey, so I didn't mind too much. Enough about me. Let's learn more about my guest. Well, as I mentioned, my guest today is Dr. Steve Pribbett. He is a Washington, D.C. podiatrist and practices podiatric medicine and surgery. He also has a special interest in sports medicine and biomechanics. He was the past president of the Podiatric Sports Medicine. He was on the advisory board of Runners World magazine, is a clinical assistant professor of surgery at George Washington University's Medical Center, and he's worked with many Olympic athletes in different sports. So what are Dr. Privet and I going to talk about today? Well, we're going to cover the most common running injuries and how to handle them why motion control shoes may be causing your running injuries, how eccentric exercises actually may be prolonging your recovery, and why a heel foot strike has been linked to reduce risk of osteoarthritis. That was really interesting. So that's enough from me with an intro. Let's get on with the interview. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Dr. Privet. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. I'm excited to have you and excited to learn more. Uh, You have such an impressive resume. I don't really know where to begin. Uh, Lots of areas that I could ask about. Um, So let's just start with what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, A lot of runners, a lot Mm -hmm. of stress fractures, a lot of tendonitis. So stress fractures might right now might be the most frequent thing I see. I also see a lot of Achilles tendon problems. Uh, medial tibial stress syndrome, also called shin splints, and sometimes ankle sprains, or at least every week. Not things we really want uh, people to be seeing, but um, I guess that's, you know, part of your job is that you're helping people. So let's kind of go on from that then with, um, you said about some of the most common things you see. Let's start with tendonitis as uh, you did write a recent article on this, um, how the word is kind of technically misused. But can you actually tell us what tendonitis actually means? Tendonitis technically means inflammation of the tendon. The word that we often use is tendinopathy. And tendinopathy includes a wide range of things that can go wrong with tendons. There's some thinking, and thinking goes in uh, almost circles, where people thought, well, Chronic tendonitis isn't really tendonitis, it's destruction of the tendon and cellular death. And then it's called tendinosis. But the only way to tell that is to cut out a piece of it and do a biopsy. So we usually either use the word tendinopathy among friends, and I'll vary depending upon how long an explanation I want to go in with each patient, (laughs) or else I refer them to my website. Oh yeah, that's probably a good idea. So when it comes to tendinopathy, what what are, what are some of the common mistakes you see runners make with when they have this kind of pain? Well, it's going to depend upon the tendon. Uh, different tendons and different problems manifest themselves in, in different places. So one thing I didn't say is I also see a fair amount of iliotibial band pain. Okay. So iliotibial band pain used to be considered or called a friction syndrome, iliotibial band friction syndrome. I never really believed there was friction there. 
And I also never believed that we needed to work from the ground up on that one. So probably about 15 years ago or, or so, um, there were a few people that started thinking that there was a, a core muscle weakness, gluteus medius muscle, and, and a muscle imbalance. And that's what people are generally working on now. So the two things that I try to do there is to get people to strengthen their core muscles and isolate the gluteus medius and also to do some side stretching. And this is for uh, IT I, band? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think there's too many people left that even use the term uh, friction in regards to that. And uh, and luckily, no one's trying to change shoes to fix that either. <laughs> uh, then let's say there's uh, Achilles tendon problems. Achilles tendon problems often come, again, many of these things happen with overtraining. So I look at overtraining as a, as a big factor. Um, with Achilles problems, there's often things that I want to correct in the shoe. Now, so often mushy shoes, shoes that are cushioned, uh, has the, the heel sink down into it. So we develop a, an, what's called an eccentric stretch or an eccentric motion. Uh, so at the time of contact or shortly after for a midfoot striker, the foot moves down and continues moving down while the calf muscle is contracting. And then it pulls sort of like a, getting yanked like a bungee cord. And that can contribute to it not healing. You know, so what we do is we make changes where things are not working and we try to not to change things that are working. So with a person with Achilles tendon issues, I might want to make sure they have a firmer shoe and I might even use a heel lift. Some people consider a heel lift the worst evil in the world, uh, but I can think of many others. Um, we don't always find that eccentric stretching works, which is where the runner stands on a step and moves down. The initial studies on that were done on fewer than 20 people in which all of them did well, but 20 people doesn't make a great study. And that was, oh gee, probably more than 10 years ago. And it hasn't been duplicated uh, in a large sense by a lot of people outside of Hakeem Alfredson's uh, uh, or his office, wherever he was doing the research. Uh, but it's interesting. It does work for some people. Now, that has evolved to uh, some physical therapists are having people, instead of standing off a step, they'll only go down to the ground and then back up. But of course, when it's really terrible and you can see a lot of tissue destruction on an MRI, you might even want to use a cast boot. And then coming out of it, we do try to gain some strength, but cautiously. Okay. And so you've said about the eccentric kind of loading and, you know, how that's not always proven to be helpful. What would you suggest instead for people who are trying to come back from an Achilles issue, but maybe don't have the money or the time to go to a physical therapist? If they're walking with a limp, they better go somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, if they have healed and they're trying to come back, it's check your shoes and see if, if it's a, a shoe that has a cloud name in it, like Cumulus or Nimbus. Those are pretty soft. Or if it's another shoe that it, it says you're going to have a smooth, easy ride, or it, emphasis is on shock absorption, I would look for what I call uh, a mild stability shoe. I find that when the term neutral shoe is used, uh, neutral is often coupled with the word neutral cushioned. So it's not truly neutral. It does something else. It's got cushioning in it. Cushioning adds to the feeling of instability, so we might also run a risk of more ankle sprains because you don't have the feedback of the ground which uh, is called proprioceptive feedback or joint position sense. You can't feel it as well. So I, I, I find that um, stability shoes is a very broad spectrum. And yes, I know you can't see it. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a very broad spectrum. And we're not looking for something that borders on what the industry calls motion control. But I look for mild stability. Um, I've also found that, uh, you know, it's been said that you can tell that there's uh, shoe changes by the way the injuries change. And we seem to be back a little bit with some more Achilles tendonitis showing up or tendinopathy um, because the shoes also have, uh, there's emphasis on cushioning once again, but also the lack of heel drop. You know, so we've gone from 12 millimeter heel drops to eight to six to four to zero. And as people are hovering around the shoe that they used a few years ago, which was 12 millimeters, and now it's eight, some, some of them are having problems. And many people you know, are not having problems. So my goal is only to change the people who are having problems, not those people who are running well. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to running, uh, is this correct in that you may experience some pain while returning to injury? You know, not a significant pain, but it's OK to run through a little bit. Do you agree with that? And if so, how much? Um, hopefully you don't have very much when you first start up again. You, you can. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of the belief in a phantom limb pain. 
I think phantom limb pain, sir, if you're missing something, um, you can have some pain memory, but basically you'd like to, I like people to start up with a walk run, uh, make sure that the shoe is definitely changed. Um, sometimes it's a four minute walk, one minute run, repeat that five times, you've got 25 minutes of exercise in. The Alter-G and other things are useful, but as you said, people don't always have money to have those in their basement or to go someplace that has that. Um, but we find that we can uh, turn that around as someone else here described. I think that you had a physical therapist that may have described that. Yeah. Several podcasts. He, he did an excellent job. And so his description of, uh, my, and my plan is very similar. So I usually start with, with uh, again, tolerance. So it might be one minute run, four minute walk, then two minute run, th uh, three minute walk, increase both. Then I have uh, somewhere buried on my site, what I call a painfully slow return to running. So once mm -hmm. you're up to 10 minutes, we then try to take a sort of a couch to 5K approach, but this is gonna differ upon the runner, their previous running experience, how long they've been down for. So for you, we'd have you back hopefully much quicker and with a, a quicker ramp up. For, but for a typical runner, it might be you know trying to encourage them to do a six week couch to uh, 5K. Okay, so just taking it very slowly, but basing it, like you said, off uh, different factors. So it does seem like you you would have to consult an expert in most cases rather than just trying to guess yourself. Well, I allow people to try to guess, but let's not you know guess for six months. <laughs> yes. you know, some, some people are guessing for three, four, five, six months, and then they'll manage to come in. Okay. Uh, but having an easy approach, but one of the things that we look for sometimes is if it aches a little bit after the run, we want to be gone by the next morning, you know, so that's a good sign. But if you're limping throughout the day, that's that's not a good sign. And of course, if you jumped up to three miles after one run, um, for you, it may be OK, but you're used to running much more mileage for someone whose maximum run has been uh, six miles. And that was like uh, eight or 10 weeks ago. You know, running three miles is going to be a bit much for them. Mm -hmm, definitely. And uh how about when it comes to uh, gait analysis? What are your thoughts on uh, having a full-on, you know, gait analysis? Or, you know, do you agree with the store version or full-on? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, Dartfish is a very good system. And I don't think I've listened to a podcast on that. But I know that you said you were done at UVA. Yes, I went yeah, to so the UVA Speed Clinic. Yeah, I've had a couple of patients go there. Uh, it's helpful for some people. And they're very good at prescribing exercises there. Uh, I have often used a, a video a visual gait analysis. And I was involved in one of the early products that came out. Now there's something called an F scan and there's in shoe variable capacitors. So we don't have a force plate. We don't have eight cameras, but we can get information from that. Uh, so the first one that came out was a long time ago. It was back in the 80s. Uh, that patent is still used now because now we have micro variable capacitors that fit in a shoe. But having eight cameras or more is really great. And the force plate is great, but not everyone can access a, a center like that. So we can, in special cases, it's very helpful. Uh, I had someone who was a 10-year-old um, uh, champion skater, a uh, speed skater, and she was having trouble uh, running and she had noticed some things in running. And we made some changes. I had seen her a few years earlier and um, uh, I see, when I was thinking of, well, where can I get a really great gait analysis to go with the video that we did in my office? And I sent her down to VA, UVA, which is very helpful. Okay, good. And do you think, do you believe everyone should get the running form looked at? Or is this just if you have pain or what's your thought on this? You know, we've, you've spoken about evolution before. And I don't think we have a lack of coach gene. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, coaching can be very helpful. You know, so again, I'm sort of in the middle on this uh, school of everyone needs a coach or everyone can run naturally. You know, uh, you can improve a lot of things with a coach. And I didn't. And hopefully um, um, you haven't formed awful habits, but some people do it. And you can see it when you run out on the street. You'll see people running hunched over. You'll see pe people crossing their arms in front of their body. You'll see people with their arms too low or their arms too high and all sorts of things. And coaches can help that. A lot of times you can do it through a local running club. So many local running clubs offer a free service of, you know, come run on the treadmill. We'll have a podiatrist, we'll have a, a coach, and we'll analyze your form. One of the most useful things is sometimes making sure that the cadence and, and the stride length are good, because people do tend to overstride. 
some people land excessively on their heels, uh, but people have changed their opinion that everyone should land on the ball of their foot. And uh, many great runners uh, do land uh, midfoot and forefoot. Um, I'm sorry, midfoot and lightly on the heel, and a few uh, marathoners will land up on the on the on the, up towards their toes. But it's actually a very few, even among the elite. Uh, you know, so when you do slow motion video analysis, the midfoot seems to be the most common there. And what are your thoughts on uh, foot strength? Do you think this is something that we need to pay attention to, or because yeah, a lot of the people we've been interviewing recently, as you've listened to, are not, you know, not big on foot strength and you know, taking that into account. But from what I have read of you, you do have a slightly different take on it. I tend to like midfoot strike, I think is ideal. Uh, if I were coaching or working with a sprinter, uh, I want them to run on the ball of their foot or else they're not going to get very far. <laughs> so different speeds sometimes call for different foot strikes. Um, I'm not terribly distressed if someone's landing on their heel and not having a problem. I do have a take on the concept of uh, when we've done studies on osteoporosis, and find that running seems to delay osteoporosis, it's all been heel strike. And so that big spike is, uh, you know, we're going to have 95% of people or more doing heel strike, uh, in which, you know, when you look at studies of what have people done in the last 10, 20, 30 years, most runners are landing on their heel. And so we find that there's less osteoarthritis, less hip osteoarthritis among runners, and we find less osteoporosis. Um, that big spike, I think, is a signal because we have a... a uh, mechanotransduction, mechanical forces transduced into biological signals. And that's sort of an alert si uh, signal in my book. Um, so we really haven't seen, we sometimes see different injuries, but we're not sure that running on the ball of your foot, it's not injury protection. Uh, someone, and I won't say who once said, throw away your high-tech running shoes and you will never have another running injury. <laughs> uh, and that is certainly marketing and not science. And it was a very unfortunate statement uh, because as it's turned out, that's just not true. So if I have a patient, though, who's using, say, a Newton or a shoe that encourages you to run on, on the forefoot or a Vibram, I really want to try to return the patient to that shoe. Uh, so I try to work within the parameters of what they found that's worked well for them. Uh, sometimes we may have to modify it slightly or for a little while. We may have to take someone from a, um, a Vibram and put them into a, a Minimus a uh, shoe, the New Balance, I think, Minimus, mm -hmm. um, and then gradually get them back. And occasionally people decide, well, gee, I had no injuries for five years before this, and let's go back the other way. But many people find that, okay, I've made the switch, my back pain is better, my hamstrings don't hurt, and I, I'd like to continue running on uh, with a forefoot foot strike, and I like these shoes. My goal is to get them back to that. So I don't want to have a religious belief or deep philosophical belief that they have to run this way, they have to use these shoes. Uh, I can say that I've never been a true fan of uh, uh, motion control shoes, but they do work for some people. Mm -hmm. They actually work better with an orthotic that forms to their foot instead of having this big box to put your foot in. So then we have something that mirrors what their foot uh, works like. And again, that's for specific problems. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of in the view of, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If, if it's working for you and if you don't have you know, issues and there's a certain shoe or certain way of running that feels good to you, then, you know, keep it going. Uh, absolutely. And when people are looking for improvement, the improvement's not going to come either in one magic uh, pill that you'll take or one, one magic food you'll start eating um, or, you know, especially not in the shoe, it's going to come in the training, which you already know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely learned that the hard way. Um, so just before we move on, I want to ask you about some other things related to that but just one more thing uh and you just mentioned orthotics what are your what is your take on custom orthotics i first try to start with changing shoes if necessary uh, altering training and looking for where the training error was because most of the time there's a training error um and doing things like intrinsic foot exercises so trying to strengthen the muscles in the foot itself now, so we'll do toe crunches quite often for many things. We'll do core strengthening, so we'll strengthen the glutes. But there are some things that just, you know, aren't going to respond to that, and an orthotic can be very useful. So it's important that the orthotic, well, sometimes over-the-counter inserts are good, but when someone has seen me after having a problem for six months, one year, or longer, uh, that's not usually going to be my first recommendation because they've already tried it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
That's good advice, Beth. Yeah. Oh, one more thing on orthotics. Yes. Yeah. Orthotics, I look at problem-oriented solutions. So the solution isn't that the person has this particular foot type. It's the person has this particular problem. And then I want to try to match the right orthotic to that problem. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That's easy to kind of take take home. Uh, and then what about, this is something I'm just curious about. I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners are interested, but I've always wondered about this. Um, I recently lost my first toenail. Uh, first time so I was a bit sad about that but when it comes to uh, toenails falling off or black you know black toenails what is that something that's inevitable or what what is that an indicator of usually and is there a way to prevent it well yes they say there's two types of people in the world those who have lost their toenails and those who may someday (laughs) (laughs) Uh, actually that, that probably happened more as a result of speed work was it speed work or plyometrics in your case yeah yeah I guess I will yeah that would, okay. that would make sense. Keep your nails trimmed relatively short, mm-hmm. so, uh, but not so short you develop an ingrowing toenail. For most people, except for workouts on the track, you usually want to have uh, a finger's width longer than your longest toe. And there's a variety of, of lacing systems that you can use. But yep. sometimes in competition or in long runs, now sometimes if you're doing a long run or perhaps a fast, hard workout, the muscle that lifts your foot up can fatigue. So the main muscle is called the tibialis anterior. And, and if that is a little bit tired to lift your foot up a little bit faster, you'll also pull into play the extensor tendon to your big toe. So you can find that, gee, your shoe is long enough, but there's this indentation or a worn spot on top of the shoe, you know, a half inch back or wherever. And that's just because of the fatigue of the other muscle. Uh, so it's not, you can have everything right and it can still happen, but not every runner does ha- lose their toenails. <laughs> and what about people that poke their toenail through the top? I think that may have been what you were mentioning right there. Is there anything they can do? Is it not lacing tight enough or what is it if people's toes pop through? <laughs> um, work on uh, calf and hamstring stretching. Okay. If you are really obsessive about it, you can use TheraBands to improve your dorsiflexors. And this just buy your shoes a little bit more often. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Actually, you say that, although I don't want my mom to listen to this post with a podcast. My mom, it loves running shoes. My mom does not run a step and she's going to kill me for saying this, but she doesn't run a step, but she buys a new pair of running shoes probably about once a month. She is more running shoes than I do, but she always pokes her toe through the top. So uh, I'm not going to tell her that, but <laughs> um, <laughs> everyone else listening, you can take that take that for advice. <laughs> so she's uh, approximately, uh, at least emotionally, matching your your running mileage. So she's doing about 400 miles a, a month. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That that must be what she's doing. It's funny. Whenever I get a new style of shoe, she wants that style, even if it's the $150 pair. She wants that one. <laughs> Um, so we, we've kind of gone over this a few times, but you uh, have listened to quite a few other episodes of the Run to the Top podcast, and you gave me some great feedback uh, with your thoughts. So I thought some of the things you talked about, I thought we'd kind of go over a little. And one thing you mentioned, which really interested me, was um, you said about um, from one of the podcasts, I believe, with Dr. Steve Ganjemi, uh, talked about arm and shoulder motion being synced to what's going on in the lower extremity and how that assists in power transfer. Can you kind of explain what you meant by that a little? Some people have talked about the fascia as an area where energy is stored. I am not so sure about that, but there is a transfer uh, in the way the muscles connect from upper extremity to lower extremity. So part of it's in the, in the nervous system and part is in the musculoskeletal system. You know, so we're kind of wired that we move one arm forward while we're stepping with the other leg. Um, and then when you're on, on the elliptical, of course, the opposite is forced into you. <laughs> uh, but the way, say, the latissimus dorsi muscle works, which is the muscle that spreads down your whole back, uh, and it's tied into your, you can't see this, but it is tied into your arm bone, into the upper part of the humerus. And so as your arms move forward, that is under some tension. And so some people have, have written, I uh, know there's some book chapters that will go over that into how uh, the, they feel that there's an energy uh, transfer and mechanism. Certainly you see for both balance uh, and motion, the people who are doing sprinting are moving their arms much faster and they're doing it in a straight line. Uh, so everything's going with mo- momentum 
in, in that direction. But that's kind of, it's not that the upper body, well, it is tied to the lower body, say at the hips and at the gluteal muscles, that's where the tie-in occurs. But I'm not sure that I can explain that really well without some pictures. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'll get you to uh, send me some diagrams that we can add to the show notes. And actually, I will mention that now. It's at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC67. Um, but related to that, so uh, you may not, this may again be that you can't explain without pictures, but why can we not just fix our arms? Like I, for the longest time until I went to UVA, I was under the belief that we just, my arms weren't strong enough or my shoulders weren't strong enough. And that's why my arms cross my body. But for runners who do cross their body with their arms or have some kind of weird arm movement, why can you not just fix your arms by strengthening your arms? It's probably an ingrained movement that you've been doing for the last 10 years. Uh, if it helps you to know that Bill Rogers did the same thing and he had a, a whipping action more on one side than the other. And didn't I've spoken to Bill, but I've never examined him. Um, Someone related it to a hip issue that he had. Okay. Why um, can't you fix it? Have you fixed it since you've been, were, it was pointed out how to work on it? Uh, no. <laughs> we're working on it. We're getting better, but no. <laughs> yeah. So they're trying to get you to move your arms more straight ahead? Yeah. I just have my left arm when I get fatigued comes really far across and twists my whole shoulder. <laughs> okay. I can't remember if it was Bill's left arm or, or, or right arm. Uh, I think it's a matter, again, of probably mental imaging, practice, and in your, um, you do 800 as your shortest speed work? Uh, well, right now I'm doing some short, some shorter okay. stuff than that. But I, I, I'm guessing most of our listeners probably don't go down to 400s and 200s like I would. <laughs> okay. Well, I used to. Uh, yeah. So in your 200s, for sure, it should be pretty easy to focus on that. And you can probably focus on it a bit in, in the 400 also. I think that it's a carryover from the shorter distance work to the longer distance work. But it does get your momentum going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you should be thinking about maybe on your recovery runs, kind of just being conscious of it a bit more. Yeah. So you okay. found more on your 18 to 20 mile runs or 16 and up, or where would you say it happens? Oh, anytime I get tired. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, they're, they're, the brain is a funny thing and mm -hmm. the brain has ingrained motion patterns that you've mm -hmm. learned. And when you're tired, it may be reverting to that. So it might not be merely a matter of strength or weakness mm -hmm. might be a, a matter of, well, you're not thinking about it anymore and it just happens because you've done yeah. it for so long. Kind of like reverting to, uh, you know, what you're used to, yeah. what, what's a habit when you, yeah, I guess that yeah. would make total sense. Well, Bill won, I think four or five New York marathons and four or five Boston marathons while <laughs> doing that. <laughs> That's reassuring. I also think of uh, Paula Radcliffe. I don't know if you know who she is. Yes. World record holder. She had a very serious Bob in her head and the, <laughs> that seemed to not hold her back too far so it's good to good to know yeah, so if you look at say david rudisha uh his arms are certainly going forward and backward as they should but a patient of mine pointed out to me uh how high up his back kick was if you haven't looked take a look at his 800 in the olympics one, once again with that in mind and you'll see he's, he's almost kicking himself in the butt and <laughs> really? else is kicking anywhere near that high Maybe that's the secret. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will take a look at that and I'll maybe put a link to a video of him in the show notes. So let's talk, kind of talk about uh, general runners, you know, mistakes runners make, misconceptions you come across from the runners you see. What advice would you like to give our listeners who, you know, may not have worked with a professional like yourself in the past? Make changes slowly. I think people have spoken before and everyone has heard of the 10% rule. Uh, I like to think of something different than that because the 10% is always moving up, up, up. And I like to see a drop back about every third week. Uh, that helps more people do well. Uh, I like uh, the concept of the 80-20 that mm -hmm. Matt Fitzgerald had mentioned. Yeah. And that's been a long time thing. I, I may have written to you about that, that uh, sometime back it was uh, called long, slow different distance. And then people thought there were trash miles, but actually they're aerobic miles. And Arthur Lydiard had encouraged that also. Pay attention to your body. There's a difference between the effort of working out hard and something that's in, in your bones or in your muscles and something that doesn't go away in say two or three days or has you limping is something to really pay attention to. So sometimes a couple of days off 
um, or some easier days can be a big help. And again, uh, ballet dancers have the same issue when they have to have three classes a day and they have a stress fracture. Where would they get a stress fracture? Just uh, uh, mostly tibia. The, the ballet one, dancer? Uh, not, not belly, ballet. Oh, oh the, ballet. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Of a belly dancer, I was um, trying to only imagine. if they have a very ample belly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and start, ballet. Yes, that yeah, would make biometrics sense. in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, good advice. But uh, when you say about listening to your body, any thoughts on how you can kind of drill that in a bit more? As I know that's something a lot of people struggle with, just knowing what that means when it comes to understanding. Because you know, every run is going to be a little bit dis discomfort, even an easy run. Discomfort is fine, uh, but if suddenly you have a pain with every step, that's not such a good thing. You know, so you may find that or you know, every third step or you end up limping by the end and having to stop. Let's see, I had a patient that something was hurting and she basically limped through it. She couldn't put her foot down flat. And so then the, her hip on the other side started hurting. I believe it was, uh, Oh, it may have been an Achilles issue, and she tried to change her stride a lot and lift her foot off of the, her heel off the ground. She couldn't put her foot all the way down, which didn't really help the Achilles. Um, her time in her half marathon was oh two twenty when she usually does about one forty five, um, and now she's probably, if I recall, wearing a cast boot. Oh wow! Okay, so finally it, it caught up to her and. Really had to yeah. take that time. Yeah, so I don't want people to panic because something hurts a little bit, or even sometimes, especially as you say, yes, your leg may have some memory if you've had a tibial stress fracture, and yes, a little bit of aching is okay, but not a lot. And don't test it by touching it to see how it feels, because you will keep remembering how it feels <laughs> by touching it. I'm very guilty of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of runners are, but you uh, know, can't help touching it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny you mentioned that because that must be something that runners inherently seem to do. <laughs> uh, it's true. And what about foot pain? You know, um, this, I mean, this is, you know, going to be something that you know a lot about. Uh, is it easy for runners to kind of detect what's going on themselves? Because, you know, there's so much going on in the foot. So how can they know what to do when it comes to foot pain? Like, is it your sharp pain you stop or like aching or you know what what advice would you give people related to foot pain sharp pain would be a good reason to, to stop but occasionally you may just have one random sharp pain and it might not ever come back again you know so one sharp pain uh okay you felt something and then you haven't felt anything for the last three days i, I don't really worry about that but a pain that's consistent uh, that I'd be concerned about. So the things that we'll see often will be, well, plantar fasciitis, which you've heard of, uh, stress fractures. Uh, so stress fractures of the metatarsals are pretty common. Uh, um, sesamoid problems or limitation and problems with the big toe, which is called sometimes turf toe in soccer players or football, as you know it. And mm -hmm. uh, um, those, those are fairly common. Also, we'll see, I think Paula, uh, had a problem with her navicular bone, if I recall. So stress fractures there and other problems can happen there. Fifth metatarsal bone, um, I don't look at that as often having stress fractures, but it can. But more often when you've inverted your foot or twisted your foot or ankle, the bottom of the bone, the base of the bone can fracture. And there's a series of things that happen on the outside of the foot, and those can sometimes be more difficult to treat. So the cuboid is named because it's shaped like a cube. That bone can sometimes get injured or have a stress fracture or a stress reaction if, if the foot inverts and the tendon below it presses up against it. Uh, I'll sometimes find that people have pain in the middle of their foot, in the middle of their arch, and they'll believe it's plantar fasciitis. But in that location, there's the tendon that helps stabilize your ankle called the perineus longus tendon. And that can sometimes get overstretched. When I find a line of tenderness across the middle of the arch that traces where that tendon is, I know that the, the tendon is affected and not the plantar fascia. And what about with those kind of, uh, all the injuries you just mentioned, are there ways to kind of keep your feet strong to prevent things? Or is this uh, a lot of them overuse that are just, you know, be careful with well, your training? For almost, for most of those, or for many of those, I do like toe, toe crunches with a towel. You know, so yes, foot muscles will weaken because they're not always used, 
Um, but strengthening those muscles, the intrinsic muscles that plantar flex your foot. There's another muscle. The initials are QP. Uh, it's got a long name with too many syllables. <laughs> um, and that's sort of some people have called it the core muscle of the foot. And that helps support your art. So you're strengthening that muscle also. So that also helps get weight off of your foot and onto your toes. You know, so that lessens the stress in the plantar fascia. And also when we're strengthening that muscle, we're sort of working with a parallel system. Above the plantar fascia are all these important muscles. And so if we crunch those and strengthen those, you lessen the stress and strain that happens in the plantar fascia. If you have a problem underneath the metatarsal, one of which is, you know, sometimes we'll say it's tendonitis, but I go ahead and explain that sometimes it's something called the plantar plate, which is an, another anatomical structure. So we have a tendon there. We have this other ligament-like tissue, and that's spelled P-L-A-N-T-A-R, which means um, undersurface of the foot, and plate as in what you might want to put a teacup on. <laughs> uh, and there's a joint capsule above it. So any of those structures can get sore, but the first thing that I try to do is one, make sure the shoe hasn't worn out in that area, lack of shock absorption, repetitive pounding, and two, uh, get them doing those toe crunches. Okay, and people can just do that from home. That's gonna just, how many reps would you say would I be good for that? Take uh, most people who are running uh, of reasonably young age, um, I usually tell them to do 15 to 20 repetitions twice a day. Okay. My other favorite exercise would be calf stretches. And if I add it on a third that I recommend a lot, it's uh, bridges or backside lifts. And uh, we'll get them to people to do those with two, two legs uh, and then ultimately uh, one leg. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, did I see an image of you doing it with weights, like the pelvic thrusts? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. So same exercise without the barbell because they don't all have trainers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very lucky in that uh, my, my strength coach, Drew, has been uh, very helpful to me. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, so, I understand that's not most people. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's uh, it's interesting to see the uh, uh, thrust and movement towards traditional strength training exercises, which is fine. Uh, I've been an advocate of at least mild to moderate ones for a, a long time. And now there's many people who know much more, who are advocating and go over, over whole programs, everything from uh, body weight exercises to, to weights as you're doing. Mm -hmm. And with the, uh, you mentioned calf stretching, um, I was told recently by um, my physical therapist who was on one of the earlier podcasts, I'm not sure if you listen, Jeremy Stoker, he um, mentioned that the, I always did the calf stretch where you put your foot up against the step or you hold it, are you a fan of that stretch or like I've had from a few people now that that's not a good idea for calf stretching? Yeah, it also pulls your toes up, which is usually not a really wonderful thing, although it's often recommended. There are some. Oh, but first, let's go over the calf stretch before I digress mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with the calf stretch, I usually like leaning towards the wall. That's, so just hands on the wall, one foot behind the other. Yeah. Kind of. OK, like that's pushing my, the wall, essentially. Yeah. Pushing the wall. Um, and second one would be that sometimes with the knee bent and, uh, for people that have been doing it, the eccentric stretch, which I think you're doing now is okay. Cause you haven't really had terrible Achilles tendonitis. I don't think, right? No, well, not really. No, <laughs> we'll keep your discussion to a minimum, but I'm happy to go over anything with you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so when it's acute, we like to rest things instead of adding more strain to it. At least that's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. you know, so I like to stop the pain rather than say, well, we'll work through the pain and then you'll be better. I like to find out, well, what works to stop the pain? So when things are hurt, normal stresses and strains are abnormal. It, it may keep the tissue from healing quickly. So I like to reduce the stress and strain in an area and then gradually resume it. I did have one runner who uh, is a 220 marathoner and he was doing a lot of um, eccentric stretching and then suddenly he was doing I think uh, 15 to 20 calf raises from that eccentric position, uh, perhaps single leg. And then after a 20 mile run, he developed some pain right behind his knee. Behind the knee is a very complicated area. There's a lot of things there. And so sometimes there's something called the popliteus tendon, um, which goes crisscross behind the knee. Uh, when I examined him, he had already had, I think at least two months of physical therapy, some dry needling and some other, other things. Um, I decided that what was really sore was his, the head of his gastroc muscle, 
which starts above the knee, and also his plantaris muscle, which was right adjacent to it. And so we definitely, we stopped the eccentric stretching. We used a, a heel lift. We had him rest a bit, and that turned out to be the answer. So that, okay. it was unusual to have a calf muscle get sore that high up. What mm -hmm. I hypothesized was that um, uh, the plantaris came in because it was being recruited as a, as a plantar flexor or uh, lift your heels up off the ground. Muscle. Yeah. And what about it just in general? What are your what are your thoughts on stretching? Are you a fan of before, after? Uh, Not really at all. There's so many different uh, perspectives on it right now. It's hard to uh, know which to follow. I thought it was gra you, you may have heard more perspectives than I have, but I th think it's gravitating towards we want to do most of the stretching afterwards. Your body's mm -hmm. warmed up, and stretching is not truly a, a warm up. So we want to stretch. We want to warm up with exercises that are similar to what we're going to be performing. So you, you know that when you're doing your um, speed workout, you might be spending a half hour or more doing some warm up exercises, some striders beforehand, some butt kicks, some high knees, and a bunch of things like that. You might stretch a little bit beforehand, but you've already warmed up your body and your body temperature before you actually do any stretching. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. Yep. Okay. Um, and then just one more thing I wanted to ask completely different. Uh, you are on, on the advisory board of Runners World. What does that involve for you? Whenever they have a question and they ask me, I answer it right away. Okay. So you are the Runners World kind of doctor online? Is I, that kind of? I think, well, not online as much as uh, if someone's writing an article, they might call me up with a question okay. about it. Sometimes I'll be quoted and there's in articles where I'm not quoted and I don't mind either way. Okay. Okay. And with your, you know, your resume in general, you have a huge list of things that, uh, you know, you're interested in and excited. Are you just one of those people that love to learn or have you kind of discovered new topics that kind of keep taking you off or what has been your reason for researching more and more? I think I, it's sort of innate for some reason. When I first started mm -hmm. using computers, uh, I got down to learning assembly language, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is deep programming. There'd be no use for that now. Um, <laughs> but just like I like basic science. So I like to see, well, where does basic science connect with uh, clinical medicine? Some people have created a field now at this point called translational medicine, where they translate basic science efforts into clinical things. Some of it may be neurological. Some of it may be cancer. Um, so one of that relates to an unusual condition that a patient had. And I had a, an outdated web page up on it. And when she came in, I uh, made some suggestions and I did some more research and found that it went all the way back to um, an ion channel, a sodium channel, uh, a mutation in that channel, which 15 or 20 years ago, no one knew about. So we now, but also this condition was so rare that, you know, it took 90 doctors to come up with 168 cases that were written up at the Mayo Clinic. So <laughs> it's rare. Um, so we try to pull in things from different areas. I'm a big fan of looking at both nature, which is British, and Science Magazine every week. So when Wednesday comes around in the afternoon, I download nature immediately and take a look. Is it always relevant? No, um, but I can usually find some way to tie a lot of things in. Mm -hmm. When the internet started, uh, I got started on the internet in 94 and then at, had my website up in 95. Uh, and I was just over, overwhelmed when there were only 10,000 web pages up. I thought, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were one of the first people to get a website then. That's impressive. It was fun and it was interesting. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't believe that it was going to be something big. But of course, now it's like, you know, it's like the air we breathe. It's everywhere. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and what is it about running that you that just fascinates you that makes you so interested in it? Like, is, have you always been a runner? Uh, yes. So that makes it difficult if ever there's a problem, because I think uh, a few people that you've interviewed had mentioned, oh, the sports psychologist mentioned we should first look at ourselves as an athlete and second as a runner. I will sometimes I've tried telling a few of my patients that to see how they'd react. But the, as you know, there's a lot of people that are runners and that's what they love. So I would be je jealous, although I wouldn't express that to someone who's also a triathlete. Uh, who also loves swimming. And I know you've been in the pool more, um, but a Alan Webb, who started as a swimmer, apparently, which I didn't know until listening to your podcast. Um, you know, so it, cross training is a good thing, but as you've said before, many people don't approach cross training until they're injured. Mm -hmm. you know, so then we have to try to find suitable cross training uh, 
uh, modalities. Uh, swimming, pool running, and other things are good. I think I find that most runners prefer swimming over pool running, although people who are more professional seem to enjoy the pool running because it mimics the the motion of running so well. I don't know about enjoy, but I think necessarily. <laughs> I like hearing, let's see, it was uh, Miss Yui who is discussing uh, different methods, so I didn't realize that there were a lot of people that actually did it in the area where you could touch the ground. No, neither did I until that podcast, definitely. Okay, so. then I don't feel so bad. No, I had no idea. Okay. And as you had in the interview, I didn't even know I was doing it wrong until <laughs> oh. until I've done it for years and years, spent hours and hours in there, but. Yeah, so she seems to be very knowledgeable in that in that area for sure. I'd only heard of the deep water pool running. Um, there also is, and other people I think have mentioned, I've been a big advocate of, of a hand bicycle. And there actually are relatively inexpensive ones that you can, depending upon what you call inexpensive, uh, that you can find on the web. And it was a patient of mine who is uh, has been a SEAL that pointed that out when I had to, he had needed some downtime five years ago for a plantar plate injury, and he needed some downtime more recently for a stress fracture, but there's a good five years between those injuries. And he's in great shape now. And when I talked to him about that, he came back with all sorts of details about how, well, once this, you're done with your hands, you can convert it and use it under a desk. So if you end up with a desk job, you can train with this if you're gonna be out of commission for six or eight weeks, instead of just doing purely uh, you know, weights and uh, millions of chin-ups. Um, and that's something that people can uh, mix in. Sometimes we'll use, uh, I spoke to a coach uh, at, a, at a school f for one of his young runners who was injured. And he asked if I thought he could uh, use the exercise bike uh, in his cast boot. And I was glad that someone else had been doing that because yes, I let people do that also. Yeah, so it's just about being creative. You know, even if, you know, one of your legs, you know, one of your feet is in a boot, you can still find something. That's that's good to mention. Yeah, always encourage uh, upper body circuits because circuits can get your uh, pulse rate up mm -hmm. and you can get at least some, not just training benefit, but the emotional and mental aspect of exercise that you really need. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, and then is there any other running related studies or, you know, topics that you wanted to kind of discuss and get across to our listeners? Uh, again, um, running shoes can cause injury, so be very careful with your fit. Be very careful with your with uh, how you change things. When you decide that you want to run more or move up to a half marathon or a uh, marathon, uh, follow a decent program. My favorite programs, though, always have about a, a drop back uh, every third week. And for most people who are doing a first time marathon, after say 18, you get up to 18 miles. I like a uh, sometimes a two week uh, easier schedule so 18 and then perhaps 10 and then 12 then back to 18 and then after two more easy weeks a push to 20 and then generally a three-week taper for most people works well mm -hmm. good, good advice and i i know actually runners connect does believe in the the cycles as well so uh, i will put a link to our runners connect coaching if anyone is interested in that as well we would love to have you on the team so it really sounds like you care about your patients and, you know, the people you see and you take the time to figure out what's going on, kind of like Dr. Ganjemi again. Uh, and you're located in Washington, D.C., correct? Yes. So it's easy for people to come find you if you are in the D.C. area. What would be the easiest way for people to kind of look you up? Would it be your website? Yeah, I think my website works best. Okay, which I will put a link to at the show notes, which again is runnersconnect.net forward slash rc67. And any other forms you would like to give people to uh, contact yeah. you? So the more interesting part of my website is going to be the running injury section, as opposed to where my address is. So I'd recommend most people take a look to see what I've written about running. There's a small blog with intermittent posts, um, but you know more people in a wider area will find the uh, material that I have online about about running in general to be more interesting than where my office is. <laughs> okay then definitely it, people can check that out and yeah there will be a link to it so i just have one more question which you know what it is as you've been listening to the other podcast yes so do I, you have a word in mind for your word of the year well if you can come up with a word that combines all those things i like to do that would be great <laughs> i found it really hard um so i came up with sort of two words that aren't totally related but i think because most of what i done i have done is sharing I think sharing has to be a word. Great, yeah. But the other word that goes with it is uh, being progressive. 
Okay. You know, so you, you never stop at any point and say, I've learned all I need to learn. There's always something else to learn okay. and, and making connections, which is not my other word, but progressive. And uh, it means moving forward. So we always want to move forward, which we like to do as runners also. Yeah, great advice. Love that. That's that's really cool. And, and I'll let you let you slide with the two words. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so we, we put a, a dash in there. and, and Yes, to make it hyphenated. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been great to kind of pick your brain and learn from you. And I'm sure our listeners have had a lot of insight as well. So thank you. I appreciate your time. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. The topics from today's episode, as well as a link to his information-packed website, which you definitely want to check out, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc67. Hopefully, you have subscribed to the podcast by now, but if you have not, and this is one of many podcasts you've enjoyed, I would love if you would do so. The more subscribers we can say we have, the bigger guest I can bring on the show. If you help us rise up the rankings, I can hopefully get one of the guests that many of you have requested, but actually haven't been able to get a hold of yet. If you do have other recommendations for guests for the show, you can email me, Tina at runnersconnect.net. Until next week, have a great week.